All right, what's up everybody, it's Ivan. Uh, it's one o'clock, we're gonna see how this goes. <clears throat> um, just a fair warning, I've had some weird internet things going on today at the, at, at the old house, and so things might cut in and out, and I certainly apologize uh, for that in advance. <clears throat> um, wanted to sort of start, start it up and see, uh, first of all, you know, in the comments, make sure I, you can hear me good. Uh, that's first. Number two, um, let's start off by talking about what you guys want to talk about. So do you guys want to talk about, um, you know, using your camera phone, you know, DSLR stuff, um, or, you know, are you talking about, you want to talk about, uh, gripping grins. You want to talk about, you know, action shots. Uh, you have this presentation set up sort of talks about all those things, but I wanted to see uh, what you guys uh, were most interested in. So uh, by all means, leave something in the comments. I am manning the, the battle station today, so hopefully I can keep up with the comments over here, make sure everything runs smoothly over here. So uh, yeah, I'll probably get started here shortly. Cool, Spades, Spade says audio is good. Perfect, all right. Uh, so it's one-on-one, what, what, might as well give it a shot. Con Conover Doug. Doug Garvey. You're so, you're so mountain town now, you know? Don't, don't forget us. Can't decide to just rock the kind of asshole can with the DSLR. Uh, from Jack. So, <clears throat> I mean, that's a, it's a completely, uh, reasonable thing to say. I, I think I've. You know, as I've gotten into photography more and brought my camera out, um, the <clears throat> biggest thing has been trying to figure out a good system to carry the camera and carry fishing stuff, especially if I'm like, it, like I do think that one thing you're going to take better photos if you aren't fishing, that should be, we should start with that number. But if you want to go fish and take good photos while you're fishing, um, you know, finding a good sort of system, right? You know, currently I use like an insert, it's sort of filled with everything, but currently I use an insert uh, that I put into this uh, Dry Creek Z backpack and so I can sort of fit both systems in there. Uh, you know, it's one of those one of those difficult decisions you have to make. I, I think if you can find a streamlined system uh, and ensure your uh, stuff, it's uh, worthwhile to take the DSLR. Um, get me off of auto, David. So we'll talk a little bit about auto. I think um, biggest thing is you know starting to use some of the priority modes, but then also I think that composition plays the biggest role. Uh, composition and lighting. Um, Doug Garvey, what photographers have you found inspiration from? Uh, Doug Garvey would be number one. Uh, you know, I actually wrote down a list of people that have sort of, I've shaped a lot of my sort of work after and sort of looked to for inspiration. Uh, Nick Kelly, uh, Rush Schnitzer, Brian Gregson, uh, Josh, Josh Dubelshain, Tim Romano, um, and then Matt Dirksen, who's the Rocky scene photographer, has helped me out quite a bit as well. Um, so those are some of the people that I've, I've looked up to in this field. Uh, Tony asks, always thinking whether to fish and photo or just go out and photo for a bit and put the gear away to fish. So I, I, I touched on that a little bit. I think um, that's probably the, where I saw my photography take the biggest jump was when I went out and only took photos. Um, now, I do think that uh, you can do both. You're just not going to get as many quality photos, but if you can come away from the day with uh, two or three and still get some good fishing in, I think that's good balance. And it really depends on what you want out of out of the day. If you're wanting to, you know, rack up a sol like a solid ten photo day where you have ten photos you can be truly proud of, I think that you know that would be less. Um, you, you'd probably want to fish less, but if you're trying to get a couple good snaps and you maybe can. Um, you know, look out in advance and see something coming together, you know, or you see good light and you, you know, sort of dedicate time to taking a photo. Uh, you know, you can do both pretty well. So uh, DSLR versus mirrorless, uh, pack multiple lenses or just one or two. 
from John Michael Haid. So um, I've never owned a true DSLR. I When I started getting into photography, I bought a Sony a6000, so I went mirrorless. Part of that reason was because of the weight savings. Um, the you know, so I've been in the Sony system since I've really started. I, you know, I, I dabbled in photography, you know, as a kid using like, you know, point and shoots and I had my dad's old DSLR. Uh, but for the most part now I've gone straight mirrorless. Uh, you know, I now shoot the a7 III um, and I will carry multiple lenses and we'll sort of talk about that. It depends on the day. So if I'm going out to fish by myself, I'll take one lens. If I'm going to fish out, fish with some friends, I might take a couple. If I'm going to take photos, I'm taking as many as possible. So. Um, using Insta360, 1X takes better photos than a little cloud cover, but the water is darked out. Sunny sky, and you can see everything well, but it's a speed bet. All right. I'm not sure what you're saying, speed bet. Is there a second part to that? Uh, RS Trout says submersion or grip and grin. Uh, certainly. You know, if you can take, uh, you know, keeping the fish as wet as possible uh, is going to look the best. Uh, certainly putting it on uh, grass, putting it on a rock, not great. Um, I do think grip and grins are, you know, perfectly great. I mean, I think they take, they capture a moment between the angler and the fish and you can do it. And we'll talk a little bit about how I like to do it. You can do it quickly and you can do it so that the fish is out of the water you know, for a very minimal amount of time. And so, so I think that is an uh, interesting conversation to have, but I, I do think ribbon grins are uh, uh, worthwhile. So we're going to get started with the presentation. Um, you know, I'll try to check over here for the comments uh, every couple slides or every slide or so. Uh, and if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to, to drop, them, drop them on. I can't talk. I'm nervous. All right. <clears throat> so brief overview. I'm going to talk about um, some major keys Composition perspective, some nerd stuff, so getting people off of auto, uh, on the water tips, sort of things I like to do, wh whether I'm fishing by myself uh, or fishing with friends, uh, and then taking hero shots, you know, getting getting those good shots for the gram. So, uh, so to start with major keys, I think one of the things, especially when I started, um, that I really got over overly tuned into was. Uh, I got lost in settings. Um, I was obsessed with, you know, getting that shallow depth of field, or um, you know, making sure I was, you know, nerding out with, you know, how, what the shutter speed was, and I paid less attention to things that you can achieve whether you're in auto mode, you're shooting with an iPhone, you're shooting with an a Android, you know, you're shooting with, uh, you know, a entry level DSLR or even, uh, you know, your high end DSLRs. Composition and light are the most important things uh, it comes to, so I know I'm having a, having a, there we go. All right. I'm going to rehash. I just see, saw the uh, feed sort of broke out. So no matter what you're using, whether it be an iPhone or a entry level DSLR or a pro level DSLR, composition and light, uh, I think are the two most important things to take into consideration when you're taking photos, whether they be of fishing, whether they be of, you know, family and friends, whatever it, whatever it might have, you might be taking a photo of, composition and light are the most important things. Um, and, you know, I don't think there's any shame in shooting auto. I don't shoot auto, um, except for when I'm shooting photos of fish that I've caught. I don't really shoot auto anymore, but, um, you know, that's because, you know, a lot of those sort of shortcuts on the, on the camera have become, uh, sort of second habit for me. So it's a lot easier for me to lock in those settings, but paying attention to composition and light are the most important things. And then with anything in life, you know, shooting, you know, if you want to improve your fly fishing photography or photography as in general, shooting a lot, shooting more is sort of the way uh, to get better. It's the, the way I've always gotten better at things is just practice. It's like old Alan Iverson said, talking about practice not the game but he was wrong a little bit because I think practice is important but neither here nor there uh, so composition uh, there's some sort of basic rules of composition that you can use um, probably the one that most people know 
uh, is rule of thirds. <clears throat> and so you can sp basically, it's the idea that you're splitting your photo into um, threes horizontally and vertically. So if you look at this photo with old uh, Conifer Doug and Courtney, uh, you have three cubes or three rectangles going vertically and then three rectangles uh, going horizontally. And those intersections, those uh, you can, when you split it up into thirds, there's four intersections um, and those are points of interest. And the rule of thirds basically allows you um, instead of putting something in the middle, it gives you a more well-balanced photo if you put a place of interest or a point of interest near or on those intersections. So in these two photos, um, you know, looking at the photo of Courtney, I wanted the subject of that photo to be Courtney, uh, you know, rowing, and to a lesser degree, uh, Connor for Doug throwing uh, streamers or whatever he was doing. And so I placed Courtney's eye close to that uh, you know, intersection of the, uh, you know, in, using the rule of thirds. So you know, that is one way to draw attention to, but also have sort of a balance in a photo. Uh, the same thing can be done with when you're taking photos of fish. Uh, this was a day in Cheeseman Canyon. You know, I, I think there's you know, a lot of good, you know, a lot of thought to be put into taking a good fish photo, then keeping it close to the water. I think, uh, you know, making sure you have a good angle, but also putting that point of focus. Uh, so the eye of that trout uh, at that, you know, close to that intersection uh, that brings um, the, brings the attention to that, uh, that portion of the fish and then just sort of lets you digest the rest of the uh, photo. Uh, if you were to say, take this fish photo and just move the fish all the way over like put the fish's eye in the middle then you'd have a sort of empty the right side of the frame would be pretty empty and um you know it'd be a little bit more distracting and be di more difficult for your eye to sort of take that image in and uh, you know have it be a sort of a clean experience um and so you you're, you can use the rule of thirds to sort of uh frame um, and fill out your frame and sort of that's one of the, another concept that people use is filling your frame out uh, So you don't have a lot of unnecessary information or a lot of information. That's difficult to sort of for your eye to uh, take in um, <clears throat> So it looks like Argus Trouts is asking where subject eyes in grid thirds in the crosshairs Yes, so the you know, I'm putting the eye at the crosshair um, And this is something you can do you can use grid lines on your camera or your phone. Um, I have grid lines, my rule of third grids turned on all the time on my camera, and it's something that you can do uh, pretty easily um, on your phone. Let's see, so, you know, in settings, let's see, settings, you go in and you can, you know, tap grid three by three. And we'll put those uh, rule of thirds in. So uh, it's something that you can use on your iPhone, something you can use on uh, any DSLR as well, and something I definitely use as a guide uh, anytime I'm uh, using a camera. So uh, another composition technique you can use is leading lines. <clears throat> um, so leading lines are uh, lines and image that lead your eye to the main subject. Uh, they create depth they sort of move your eye uh, naturally through a photo so um, there's not dis you know, distracting elements but you're sort of um, using those lines to focus your the you know, person who's looking at the photos eye at the subject and so there's two examples of uh, you know leading lines here um, with these two photos the first the top left is uh, Josh in Cheeseman Canyon. And the nice thing about um, nature and fly fishing for that matter is there's a lot of opportunities for leading lines. Um, fly line, rods, nets, branches, the river, uh, ridge lines, grass. Uh, there's a lot of things that can lead your eye towards the subject and you can use those uh, to sort of define a um, you define the subject well, but also have the, the person who's taking that photo in uh, sort of uh, digest it in an easy way. So uh, Josh's 
you know, casting towards this bottom right corner of this photo, and that fly line leads you towards towards him as the angler, um, and you know, gives you a sort of a clean way of uh, leading your uh, or putting the subject in focus. Um, and then this is a picture on the Arkansas. You're you know getting lower, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, changing your perspective. But the river itself is sort of the lead, leading line towards the angler uh, there casting towards the opposite bank. So um, you know, using leading lines, you can also, if you go back, you know, let's say oars, oars are a good leading line. So if you look at this photo of Courtney, um, you know, the oar is pointing towards the action. And that's just another way to lead your uh, audience's eye back towards the subject in, uh, at hand. Uh, best aspect ratio, free form or 16 by nine. Um, I shoot for the most part, so that's RS Trouts again. Uh, I shoot for the, I mean, I don't shoot 16 by nine anymore. I used to shoot 16 by nine, um, but I just shoot primarily in, was it four by three, I guess. Um, just getting all the uh, data off the sensor. Uh, and then you can crop from there. Um, the, uh, I think it really, like I think 16 by nine is a cool aspect ratio. Uh, I think you can crop creatively to frame um, the photo best. So if you want to eliminate distractions, uh, if you wanted to, um, you know, have it be really grand, you can, you know, use a wider aspect ratio. If you wanted to you know, sort of get something that's a little bit more Instagram friendly or, you know, just eliminates distractions, you can drop it down a little bit um, and use a, a smaller aspect ratio. When I'm shooting raw on my camera, I shoot, I don't crop at all and then let, I'll do the cropping in post. So, um, so that was leading lines. Uh, so another, you know, compositional technique that you can use uh, is foreground, uh, creating a defined foreground, subject, and background. Um, so this helps to place, you know, sort of call your subject out. Uh, so here in Cheeseman Canyon, uh, the top right, top left photo uh, I'm looking at is a photo I took of Scott Dixon, our head guide uh, here in Denver. And, you know, I'm sort of getting lower, allowing the rocks to be in the foreground, allowing the river to be in the foreground. You know, Scott's there in his damn camo waders, which are borderline impossible to uh, photograph. He's fishing and then you have a defined background. So that gives you, tells you a uh, entire story. Uh, you can see, gives you context, um, you know, places him in the scene and then allows you to sort of understand what's going on in the scene. You know, the same thing goes with Zeke. You know, I have used the, you know, willow cover in the foreground to frame him in the, as the subject. And then you have a background behind him so you can sort of get some good context. Um, so foreground, subject, and background. Uh, you know, using that as a compositional technique to sort of create depth, puts focus on the subject, and it also leads your eye towards the subject. So, oh, Max is Max created a YouTube channel. It's good to see you, Max. Thank you. Um, make sure I have all the questions. Cool. Uh, what do you guys think so far? Do you guys uh, have any questions? Um, yeah. How bad am I? St stuttering. This St is st stuttering. Ugh. All right. <clears throat> so. Uh, next thing, next compositional technique that I like to use is eliminating distractions. Uh, so you want, you know, there's a balance between having, um, you know, only, you, you don't want to isolate the subject too much at times, but you can, how, how can I say this? You don't want to have, you want to have context. You want to tell a story. So you want to have elements that tell, like every photo tells a story. You want to have elements from the scene helping you tell the story, but you don't want to have extra things sort of distracting your eye uh, when you're trying to take that photo in. Uh, so eliminating distractions, you can, um, you know, say like there's a lot of uh, willowy, you know, sort of banks around the state, around the West. Um, and sometimes that can be a bit of a distraction. And so you can use solid backgrounds as a way to isolate the subject. Um, the you know sky so in this picture of tanner uh you know with the sun going down the sky sort of uses use him as a 
uh, use the sky as a background, a simple background that allows the subject to pop. Uh, you know, snow for this example down in the bottom right. Uh, you know, Scott Dixon wearing his camo waders that are borderline impossible to pick up on uh, in a camera. You know, I I remember that day. I think it was out. Actually, Max was uh, visiting, and we were in Cheeseman Canyon, and I saw this you know patch of snow, and you have you know Scott wearing black and tan and basically all the drabest colors you can. And yeah, obviously that's good for fishing, but it's not great for photos. So I had, I saw that patch of snow. I had him stand up in front of that patch of snow and throw a couple casts while I got in position to take the photo. And so you can see his profile um, against that snow a lot better than you could if it was, if he was right against the rock, um, especially with what he's wearing. So it allowed me to sort of isolate him and put him in the scene. And then again, I used the subject uh, you know, foreground subject and then a background to sort of uh, hammer that home as well. Um, so, you know, this picture of Landon that I really like, I personally really like it. You know, it's, I like the geometric nature of it. You have, you know, the, you know, water in the foreground and then you have this you know, sort of green line of willows and then that uh, slope in the background. But, you know, these are all sort of simple elements and uh, it allows for, you know, the angler to be a little bit more distinct and sort of drawn out. Um, a lot of times with those willy back, willowy backdrops, uh, you know, we as anglers can sort of blend in a little bit, which is obviously is good for fishing, but, um, you know, keeping the background simple uh, and eliminating distractions is a good way to sort of isolate your subject. So uh, let's see, let's go to comments. I can keyframe, crop position, adjust aspect ratio, and look in any direction in post, shooting up to five minutes in through it. Can shoot HDR auto doesn't always cut it. Which one of these two things would make the most well-rounded compromise? RS try. Okay, so we'll we'll talk a little bit about that stuff, babe, but here shortly. Uh, RS Trouts asks if you use red shirts for your shots. I'm sort of wonder who RS Trouts is. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, like you can use uh you can use um. Like I'll ask certain people to like if we're going out to shoot, like I'll ask them to maybe wear some a color that you would pop a little bit more. Uh, but I mean it's whatever they feel best in. Um, so definitely you can use colors to help the uh, angler pop or the subject pop. Um, where are Strouts? Who are you? What's up, Luke? My sister's. What's up, sister? Hi, Franco Fontana. Nice. Uh, perspective. So um, one of the things I see a lot of people do when they're first starting out and it's something that I certainly did is uh, when I go to take a photo, I will uh, like I would, you know, say with my camera or my phone, I would just stand as I normally would stand and take the photo, maybe tilt my camera, you know, down, maybe tilt my camera up and you sort of lose a lot of context there. So uh, you can achieve a lot of those sort of things we talked about with composition uh, by changing the level of your camera or your eye, so to say. Uh, so by getting lower or higher. Um, and that getting lower or higher can uh, isolate the subject and create a little bit more interesting composition. It's a picture of Dennis on the dream. And so in this instance, I got lower. It allowed me to capture a bit of his reflection, but then also put him as the angler sort of in the rule of thirds. And then... Um, you have these foreground elements and a you know, sort of the background element. So you have all these things working together to sort of draw your eye towards the subject and then allows you to sort of take that photo in um, and sort of digest it uh, after the fact. So like the way I've sort of learned is that you want elements in the photo to draw your eye to the subject and then, but you also want the person looking at the photo to uh, sort of digest everything, digest the whole story. And I think I've probably rambled on about this a couple times, but uh, in this instance, you know, it's a winter day. You know, I'm trying to get winter things in the, you know, in this frame. And so trying to get the ice in the frame, trying to get this clear blue sky, you know, the, you know all these elements that sort of tell the story about the day uh, you know, when Dennis was out there on the dream. And then uh, you can also, you know, get lower or higher uh, to create what's called the hero angle. Uh, and this is something we'll talk about with hero shots, but this picture of Tanner here, 
you know, I put the, the fish as the subject. Obviously, Tanner is like sort of the secondary subject. Um, you know, the fish's eye is at, you know, sort of the intersection of the rule of thirds. Uh, and then, you know, we filled the frame quite a bit. You still get some context or some snow, uh, but we're lower than he is. And then actually, they talk about it in like all the Marvel and DC movies, like the hero angle, where they, they generally show the hero for the most part, they show the cameras pointing up at them. And so you can do the same thing, um, you know, with, you know, a hero shot, a hero shot. The idea is like, Hey, look at, I mean, let's break it down to what it is. Look at me, look at this fish I caught and you're trying to pump that person up. And so you get a little bit lower, uh, to create, um, sort of that idea that you this is like this huge moment. This like, I'm great. Or this person's great. Tanner will tell you I'm great. Look at this fish. It's great. Everything's great. Um, so you can, you know, bend your knees, crouch down, or my least favorite thing to do is hike up and down. Um, but you can do that as well in the landscape. Uh, say hike up, in, if you're in Cheeseman, hike up, and then shoot down to give you a little bit, a little bit different perspective than what you would normally see. Uh, so it does take, obviously, a little bit of effort, but um, the, you know, extra effort can pay off. Uh, with creating a unique sort of perspective, one that you normally wouldn't see when you're on the river just looking and taking stuff in. Our Strauss. R.S. Trouts is uh, in the cut, low key. I think very, very talented, is my guess. Um, spade bit. So go back a little bit. I can keyframe, crop position, adjust aspect ratio, I'm looking in any direction in post, shooting up to 5.7K in 360 degrees. You can go in, uh, through all the ISO, shutter speeds, and exposure. You can shoot in HDR. Auto doesn't always cut it. And which one or two things would you? make the most well, would make the most well wanted to compromise. So, uh, so maybe it's talking about the Insta360s. I actually haven't used those a lot. I've been considering picking one up because I do think it offers an interesting perspective. Um, if, and I'm not sure how the uh, Insta360 works, but um, what I would focus on most, are you, if you're, and I suppose I'll ask these questions. Are you taking photos or are you taking video and then cropping and then like screenshotting that video? So they're probably two different things when it comes to, um, you know, the advice I would give. So maybe if you want to follow up there and then we can talk a little bit more about uh, what settings I think would be um, the two things to sort of focus on. All right. Nerd stuff. So, so, so let's start off uh, raw versus JPEG. If you're shooting on a DSLR, even if you're shooting on a camera, uh, if you have the opportunity to shoot raw, shoot raw. Uh, this is a picture of Cody up in Wyoming. Um, I actually really like these kind of days where uh, you have super, super overcast days, but you still obviously, like in the middle of the day, there's the sun's at its highest point, still trying to shoot as much light through those clouds. And you get this really uh, flat, you take these really, these photos that look really flat uh, in camera. And then in post, you can uh, actually have a lot more um, flexibility and you can really make things pop without losing some of the detail and losing color, sort of the consistency of color. Sometimes in, you know, more direct light, you, uh, you can edit stuff and make the exposure look great, but then the photo, the uh, colors sort of change a little bit and they get altered. And I think, you know, having take, being able to take raw, uh, is sort of the way to go. Uh, if you're taking photos at all with any camera, uh, just cause it allows you a little bit more wiggle room in post. Um, I don't have my work computer set up for this, but if I did, I would pull up like the original and the, and that one. And I think you can see how much more you can do in post. Um, you know, some people poo poo, like over editing, I think um, you know, people have always edited photos 
uh, you know, it depends on how much effort you want to put it, put into it, but you can certainly shoot to edit, um, as opposed to edit after the fact. So you can, you know, change your settings because you know, this is what the light condition is and what you want to get out of the photo. And I think, you know, shooting to, with the idea of what edit you want to do is uh, definitely something that I still do quite a bit. Um, so <clears throat> modes, auto, aperture priority, shutter mode, and manual. Uh, those are the sort of the four big ones. I honestly, uh, one of the things I wish I did more, uh, when I got my A6000, um, you know, seven, eight years ago, I was obsessed with putting things in F1.8 and you know shooting the highest shutter speed and i didn't pay any attention to composition lighting was like a afterthought in many ways um so i do actually encourage you guys to shoot in automotive and pay attention to the sort of the the things that make a good photo a good photo i think you can change the settings to um make a good photo better but i think a good photo you can take a good photo under most any condition in auto. You just have to pay attention to the composition and lighting from my perspective. Um, <clears throat> aperture priority mode. So aperture basically is the amount of light you're letting in and it also you can use it to create shallow or broad depth of field. Um, the smaller the number, the shallower the depth of field. So you know the, let, the more uh, sort of blur or bo bokeh or whatever, however it's said, you'll see in the background. Um, and, you know, with the broad sort of F11, F22, you're looking at, you know, everything's going to be in focus, but you probably have to bring down the shutter speed quite a bit if you want to keep your ISO lower. Um, and so aperture prior mode, I think, is really good for portrait stuff. So if you're taking fi uh, photos of fish, so say this fish uh, that Aaron caught, um, you know, that would be a good option, a good instance where you could take, uh, you know, a photo using auto mode, but I think aperture priority mode would work as well as well. I think with, uh, you know, a lot of fish photos, I would set it to like F4 to F5, 6. I think if you get too low, if you go down, like I think to 2.8 and 1.8 and, you know, 1.4 if you can, you end up sort of losing a lot of the detail that makes a fish pretty cool. I think there are certainly op opportunities to, um, you know, shoot, uh, you know, super shallow depth of field with fish. But uh, I do think if you're taking a photo like that, you want to use like F4, F5, 6, maybe F8. Um, so you get a little bit more uh, detail in the fish, but, you know, the focus is sort of on that, you know, the head of the fish. I think, you know, sometimes uh, depth of field can be overdone. But you know, if you wanted to take a landscape and you had a tripod, you know, you're in aperture priority mode, you're only controlling the aperture, you know, bringing that aperture up F8, F11, uh, F16, F22 if you can, uh, and that can take a really good uh, landscape because everything's going to be in focus um, and you're going to get more detail out of everything. Uh, shutter priority mode is, you know, when you're trying to f either freeze motion or, uh, you know, get that blur uh, like you see here is a picture of the uh, the reel uh, on the Dreamstream. Uh, so I think that was probably set to 1 40th, 1 over 40, 1 40th uh, shutter speed. And, you know, if you want to freeze motion, you know, generally you're looking like 1 1,000th, 1, uh, you know, 1 over 500 probably is the baseline. And then, you know, trying to, to pump that up as much as you can if you want to actually freeze uh, you know, casting or freeze a fish swimming away or something like that. Really, when you get into one over 250, you know, and lower, you know, one over 100, you're definitely not going to freeze motion. Um, you certainly can do certain things to do that, but uh, you're not going to freeze real true motion at all. Um, so, trying to keep it over 500, over a thousand if you really want to freeze it, um, closer to 2,000 if you like want to have it etched in stone. So. Um, manual mode gives you full control, controlling aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. A lot of this stuff, and you know, I've I wasn't trained in photography at all. I've sort of basically scoured the internet and read read some stuff for the last eight years, and 
Um, you know, people, there's a lot of people who can describe auto mode, you know, aperture priority mode, shutter priority mode, and manual mode better than I. You know, there's the idea of the exposure triangle, um, you know, with aperture, you know, your exposure being a mix of aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Uh, you know, I would recommend you guys checking out um, you know, some stuff on YouTube or you know, searching the Google for you know a little bit more in-depth conversation there. I do think um, you know having a good understanding of that stuff, especially when, when you're getting into manual mode. But even if you're using aperture priority mode or shutter priority mode, uh, is beneficial. So uh, understanding how those all those things play together, um, I'll probably I'll put some links in the description after the. Uh, presentations over and uh, get you a get you a good resource there. But uh, you know, let's say this photo of on uh, the top left of Conrad. You know, that's an instance where manual mode is the preferred mode. Uh, anytime you have a back, you know, you have something that's backlit. Uh, you know, I, I wanted detail from Conrad to show. I wanted to have sort of a glow around him with the sun. And so I was able to dial in and I probably shot, I don't know, 50, 50 photos of him fishing there. Uh, and just, you know, looking, reviewing, you know, dialing, you know, maybe pumping up the shutter speed, dropping the aperture down. So, you know, open up and let more light in, uh, and just sort of tinkering until I found the right balance there. Um, you know, this example of this picture here of Josh in the bottom left in, in Cheeseman Canyon, yeah, that's a great example of auto mode. You know, I think auto mode can be, um, you capture most photos, uh, that you're trying to take out there on the water. Um, and you know, in that instance, you know, you're freezing motion to a degree, you know, he's not actively casting. Um, so you don't have to make a ton of choices, but auto mode would capture that photo really well. So um, I think one of like for my for me, especially when I'm when I first started out, I think I'm going to harp on this uh, a little bit more. But um, you know, composition, light, those are more important than anything that you do. And and I think you can sort of add cherries on top by you know learning techniques. You know, whether it be figuring out what shutter speed will blur motion versus freezing motion and, you know, figuring out what aperture is best for creating the depth of field you want. Um, but, you know, I think a, the basis of a good photo is composition and light. So, all right, uh, fine tuning. So when I'm taking photos on my DSLR, I always have the rule of thirds grid lines up. I always have the histogram up. So I know if I'm blowing out a photo or if I'm underexposing a photo, I always use metering, whether it be multi center or spot. And you sort of use those for different, um, you know, different conditions for the most part, I'll be honest, and it's a little bit basic of me. Uh, I end up using multi or center quite a bit. Uh, if I'm doing something where it's backlit, I might switch to spot metering mode where it's only taking the uh, subject that's in my sort of focus area in uh, to consideration when it's trying to meter that. But uh, for the most part, I stay in sort of the basic modes and maybe eyeball it a little bit more if I'm uh, doing something <coughs> backlit or something like that. Uh, histogram, so this is grabbed from, um, from the uh, internet, but it's, light, it's basically Lightroom. So you can see it in the bottom left or bottom right corner of the screen at, uh, above on my camera. This is sort of a, what you'd see when you're editing uh, and basically breaks your, your photo into the blacks, shadows, midtones, highlights, and whites. And you know, you can see in this instance that the what on the camera above, the whites are, there's a lot of whites. The whites are clipping. Uh, and if I wanted to bring the exposure down a little bit, even though you know, it's showing, you know, metering is showing it's a balanced photo. I could do that in manual mode, maybe, you know, bring up the uh, shutter speed a little bit. That would probably uh, darken up the rest of the scene. So you'd have to mess with a lot of the uh, exposure stuff in the in in post. And a lot of the newer cameras can um, recover highlights and shadows a lot easier, but, uh, you know, just something to consider. So uh, for focusing, I tend to use a spot focus as opposed to a center balance focused or a zone um, because I want to choose the thing that I want to focus on. Uh, I think that would be sort of the next thing.
thing if you're looking to, you know, if you're in auto mode but you want to improve your photos, I would say choosing your focus point. Uh, that's the next sort of creative control that I would take from my perspective if you don't want to mess with the settings. Um, so using spot focusing to uh, pick out your subject and you're picking out the subject, I think that's a big thing. And then I'll use manual focusing here and there. I don't like it. I'm terrible at it, but if I have to, I'll use it. Uh, this is, let's see, make sure no more questions in there. Uh, so this is what I use. Um, I sort of purposely put this at, towards the end because I think it's less important than uh, some other things, but this is what I use. Uh, so I have the Sony a7 III uh, with uh, 35 mil 1.4 uh, Sigma. I sort of workhorse has been the 28 to 75 2.8. Um, I also have the 70 to 200 f4 and um, 30 millimeter macro is actually a uh, crop sensor. And then I just picked up the Sony 20 to 20 f 1.8. Um, so that's sort of what I've, I use. I think using sort of, you know, once you start to get into manual mode, you know, using a circular pol polarizer uh, to control um, glare on the water is important. Um, you know, I use a variable ND filter for a lot of the video stuff I do, but I also uh, picked up a 10 stop for doing more landscape stuff. Um, and then, you know, I use Lightroom, Photoshop, Lightroom Mobile, and the, and the like. So um, I think good places to start. So entry level, this is what I started off with, was the Sony, 6, 000, Sony A6000. I started off with a 35 mil 1.8, and that was equivalent to a 50 mil. I think starting off with an inexpensive prime is probably the way to go. Um, I was I, I sort of came up under uh, Rush Schnitzer, who gave me a lot of guidance in the beginning, and he was very adamant that uh, I start with a fixed prime lens. Uh, not only gives you a little bit more flexibility with being able to let in more light, because it's uh, Instead of having a variable aperture, it has a fixed 1.8 aperture, not fixed 1.8 aperture, but it can go uh, as op wide open as 1.8, and I think it was all the way up to f22. Um, so the idea with having an inexpensive prime lens as opposed to a zoom lens is that you are learning what that focal length does and what you can do with that focal length. Obviously, with a 70 to 200, there's the, you can achieve reach so you can get things that are maybe farther away you can get a good photo of them but there's also the aspect of like at 200 if i take a photo of a fish at 200 the background will be super super blurry but if i take a photo at 35 with a 35 millimeter um you know it's not going to be as blurry and so figuring out how you know what a certain focal length does and becoming a master of that focal length i think is uh, a really good way to start uh, sometimes you can get lazy when you have a zoom lens and i'm certainly i certainly fall into that that uh, category when i have a zoom lens and you can you're changing you're being lazy and not moving your feet and sometimes uh you're not getting as quality of a photo as if you moved your feet and framed it appropriately with a uh, with a prime lens. So spade bit, bit uh, so slowing down the shutter speed will generally increase the darkness while increasing the shutter speed will brighten and whiten the photo. Yes. So the like one over 50 is going to allow more light in than one over 200 or one over 100. One over 50 isn't going to freeze motion. One over 1000 will freeze motion. Um, so you can mess with that if you're taking photos, you can, and you want to let more light in, and you don't care about what the motion's doing, by all means, mess with the shutter speed. If you want to let more light in, but freeze motion or, um, cre you know, what you know, freeze motion or sort of make motion blur, then you know, shutter speed is the thing to control. If you just want to let more light in, aperture is the way to do that. Um, so, you know putting your aperture wide open uh, will let more light in. It will decrease the focal plane, so um, you won't have as much, 
to focus, you know, uh, to be in, fo not as much will be in focus, but um, it's certainly something you can do if you want to let more light in. Um, <clears throat> I'm a firm believer in uh, YouTubes. Uh, I go to YouTube anytime I have a photo question. I don't know if that's the best thing to do, but it's certainly uh, been a helpful resource for me. Uh, there's certainly a lot of, you know, books that you can you know, sort of read as you're getting into it, but um, I, I always used YouTube. And I always, like, for the most part, uh, you know, Doug asked me, you know, what photographers sort of I look to. I, especially when I started was starting off, I wanted to recreate things that I saw. And so I would try to figure out, problem solve what they did, like reverse engineer what they did to try to figure out what I could do uh, when put in that situation. So I think using other people's work as inspiration to figure out the thing you're trying to achieve, I think that's, uh, you know, really was a, an effective way for me to learn. So Davis James, fist pumps and cameras, man. Yeah. Fist pumps, cameras, and cookies. Um, all right. So this is on, on the water tips. So if you're fishing by yourself and you're wanting to take uh, better photos of your fish. <clears throat> um, I think number one, <clears throat> get a big deep bag. Get a big deep deep net that you can keep a fish in that will allow him to be happy, breathing oxygen, like in a good place. Uh, so I have the rising net. I put it, you know, have a huge deep bag in it. Allows me to, if I'm fishing by myself and I want to get my camera out, allows me to sort of twist the top and sort of close off the top and let them sit in the water, you know, facing upstream, letting the oxygen run through their, you know, the, you know good, you know, oxygen rich water, you know, run through their gills and keep them healthy, safe, happy, and all that stuff. Um, and so it lets me get my everything set, lets me get my camera. You know, I'll probably put it in auto mode if I'm just taking photos of my of my own fish, um, and you know, lets me sort of get set and gives me time to prep. Um, so the top two photos are photos that I took of fish that I caught, and you know, I was spraying and praying. Uh, you know, I think that's another thing that you know I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, spraying and praying is perfectly acceptable, especially when taking photos um, of your own 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 fish. Um, also fish look better when wet and near water. Uh, so, a, you know, a net allows you to do that, um, pretty effectively, obviously. Uh, you know, I think you see a lot of people taking fit, photos of fish on rocks and grass. You know, that's going to mess up with, mess with their, uh, their protective coating. And, um, I don't think fish look as good when they're sort of not near or in the thing that they, uh, naturally like being in. So. Yeah, keep them wet, Davis. Um, <clears throat> so in you know in this instance, the top two photos I was I took on sort of the wide angle. Uh, I think I had a 14 millimeter Rokinon f 2.8, super wide angle, and that sort of allowed me to sort of position the fish and then take a couple shots, spray and pray style. Um, you know, sort of you know doing things a little bit weirder. Uh, you can also do that with your phone. Um, you know, you can ha set it to burst mode and stuff like that. Uh, and I think that is uh, a good tool as well. Um, also, when you have a net, it sort of frames the, the subject as well. It gives you uh, sort of uh, good context about what's happening. So uh, burst mode. So this isn't the old days. Um, I know some people don't love the fact that we can spray and pray these days, but uh, I am a firm believer that um, you should use all the benefits of digital photography to your advantage. Uh, in this instance, Zeke was, this is on the Williams Fork, Zeke was fishing upstream me. I think I was tinkering around with my bag. I was towards the end of the day and um, I heard him like hooting and hollering, like yelling, I got one, I got one, I got one, I got one, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, God, okay. Zeke better not be a small fish. And I, he comes, like, whipping around the corner, and I actually put it into shutter priority mode because I saw him running downstream, and I wanted to capture 
that motion and not get things too sharp. And so I think I put it, I think one, I, I have to look back at it, but I think I was probably like one, one hundredth probably, and um, didn't really care about depth of field. And I got him sort of locked in and then just sort of followed him as he went downstream. Um, that obviously can tell a story. So you can put all these images together to tell a story, but you can also pick out one that you think is um, sort of the best of the, the bunch. So, you know, don't be uh, ashamed to uh, use burst mode, load up that, uh, you know, memory card. I mean, now more than ever, digital storage is uh, relatively inexpensive. Um, and, you know, I think we should use that to our advantage. So <clears throat> burst mode, big fan. Uh, same thing if you're doing like a quick shot of a fish, you're bringing, you know, having your, the person holding it, bring it up. Uh, you, you want the water droplets dropping off. You know, you use burst mode. You're not going to be able to predict when the water gets best um, in, you know, a three second span. You might as well let it rip and let it fire. Um, I think communication is also key. Uh, <clears throat> so... You know, I go fishing with a lot of friends. Some of my friends uh, don't want to deal with all my stupid shit, and some of my friends do. Uh, I think if you have an idea, communicate that idea to your friend. Don't be afraid um, to let, you know, give someone, like if you have an idea, don't let like being scared of it be the reason you don't get that photo. So, you know, up here, uh, this was in Belize. I told my friend Chuck to, they got, it was raining. It was like the skies opened up, uh, thunder, lightning. It was terrible. And it was like our first day. It was like not the best omen for the rest of the trip. But I thought it was, I mean, it was, it was a moment. It was a moment that sort of described that trip. And so I had, like I told him, I was like, hey man, just go stand underneath. And I just kept on adjusting him left and right to, until he was, like sort of framed well underneath that uh, that that roof, and it gave sort of context to what was happening. You know, he's super bummed out that it's uh, raining, and uh, you know, you get a little bit more context. And being able to tell him what to do uh, was certainly good. So having a friend that's willing to uh, go along with your stupid ideas is always a positive. Um, also, you're going to take a ton of bad photos. I always take bad photos. I will continue to take bad photos. Um, Bad photos are a part of the process. Don't be afraid of them. Uh, you know, for this one, I was in Florida visiting uh, family, and my friend Kyle and I went out and fished uh, snook uh, uh, under the dock lights. And we didn't turn on our headlamps for the entire night, but I thought, oh, this might be a pretty good photo. And, uh, you know, exposed for the fish, kept everything dark. It just sort of gave us this weird, uh, this weird look. It's not your typical thing, like, as opposed to getting a super grainy photo with his face and you know, the fish would look blown out. Like I figured let's try something different and he was willing to try it. So uh, don't be afraid to communicate. Um, and if you find the photo that you want to take and you need somebody to be in it, like tell him, tell him to be in it. I spent a lot of years being afraid to tell people to be in things. And uh, I don't know why. Just do it. Uh, hero shots. All right. So sort of, uh, the, I guess this is the the thing that probably most of you guys might be the most interested in. I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> so this is tips for the hero. Uh, and you'll see, you know, these are pretty similar for both the hero and the photographer. But uh, take, take a moment. So using your net, keep that fish happy. Keep that fish wet. Keep him breathing. Uh, you know, figure out, like flip them, figure out which side is the better side. You know, I don't want to sound shallow, but there's certain sides, like, I, I don't know if my right left side is the better side, but one of them is the better side. So figure out which side is the better side. Um, get into position. You know, get your settings set. Uh, oh, sorry, this is for the, the hero, the hero, not the photographer. So have them get into position. So if you're the photographer, um, you know, tell them where you want them to be, how you want them to hold it, um, and as the person who caught the fish, you know, sort of tell. Tell your photographer how you want to hold it or how you feel most comfortable holding it and let them adjust to that. Um, 
keep it wet. Keep it, you know, sit, get your grip set under the wa- underwater. Support and don't squeeze. I think if you squeeze, that fish is gonna, uh, you know, sort of. I'm drawing a blank. If you squeeze the fish, it's gonna flop all around. Um, and I'm not very good at this, but hide your fingers. So sort of bring your, you know, your fingers back. So instead of, you know, letting your fingers be out in front of the fish, sort of uh, interrupting, you know the canvas that is this you know their good side you know keep your fingers back maybe put the two you know fingers behind the uh you know on on the back side you know, try to support that fish uh and i think angle is also important um you know you'll notice that you know tanner here tanner's pretty good at taking photos with big fish that he catches and he does happen to catch a lot of big fish but he also has a good tilt to it so you have a little bit of dimension out you know a little bit of depth created and you put the subject sort of closer to the um, to the camera and you know you're not long arming per se but you're just giving a little bit more depth and he's obviously very uh, adept at that same you know same thing with Courtney and Landon you know they've sort of found the hold that works best for them um, and you know I think generally if you bring the fish up let the sort of water drip down off of it Put the fish down down back in the, into the water. You can either have the person who took the photos review those photos, or you can just say, "Hey, let it rip and uh, let it back and send it back." I'm really good at this uh, second to last step, making stupid faces. Um, I'm actually pretty pretty bad at making faces. So I'm just getting a a note that uh, not enough video to maintain smooth streaming. Are you guys get? Is it still good out there? You still good? All right. Hopefully. Looks good here. All right. Uh, for the photographer, so same thing. Take a moment. Determine what you want the background to be, what you, uh, where the better light is. Um, so, you know, generally you want to have the light sort of clean, flush on one side or completely uh, not in the picture at all, like we're not playing a role at all. So, um, you know, determine light and background, get your settings locked in, talk about, you know, communicate with your, uh, the person who has, who's holding the fish, um, or is going to hold the fish about how they're going to hold it. Uh, if you have a critique that you, if you want them to hold a certain way, let them know, get into position, you know, get everything framed and then let it rip. Uh, so, you know, Placing you using the rule of thirds, you filling the frame, um, you know maybe getting lower to create that hero angle using burst mode, you know all those all those compositional techniques to try to make the best photo. And you can see in both of these instances, you know Jack and uh, Conrad holding. And these aren't necessarily you know the biggest fish by any stretch of imagination, but um, you know you you know the one of Conrad he's keeping it close to the water. You have that light sort of coming from like basically be a little bit to the like the right hand side of the of me of me the photographer and uh, you can see the entire fish it's not the light isn't choppy uh, sort of getting a really clean um, look at that brown and you also get you know Conrad in there um, sort of using the net as a frame and stuff like that so uh, <clears throat> that's it I guess oh man uh, so that's it. Uh, you guys have any questions? Um, let me know. RS Trouts. Yeah, I uh, I had a website. they in the in the process of redesigning it. Uh, a lot of you know, obviously, I do a lot of the I do the photo work uh, for Trouts. Uh, so if you go to uh, troutsflyfishing.com or uh, the Instagram at troutsflyfishing. Um, you know, that's all my stuff for the most part. And then, uh, my personal, uh, Instagram is Yukon goes fishing at Yukon goes fishing, uh, and getting a website in the works, uh, here in the next coming days or, you know, during this, uh, during this, this odd time, I figure this is a good time for me to get a website up. So, uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions about, um, anything specific, I know I sort of rushed through a little bit of the setting stuff. Do you guys, Want to talk about um, aperture, preferred uh, 
preferred shutter speed, all that stuff, or uh, you want to call it, let me know. Tell me how bad I sucked. Let me, uh, let me know, let me know in the comments how bad this was. Like, please, burn me. All right. Jack Shirk asked how to launch my career into fly fishing photography. Uh, okay. That's a, that's a really weird long answer. I'll try to do uh, the my best to provide a reasonable answer. So um, I went to grad school, uh, University of Montana for fluvial geomorphology. Basically, I was going to do river restoration. Um, and then... I don't know if you guys have ever been to Missoula, but uh, it's pretty good trout fishing there. And I didn't, I did a pretty good job of going to class, but I did a terrible job of actually finishing my thesis because I went fishing too much. And I started off like taking videos with a flip camera, one of those shitty little flip cameras. And then I moved to a GoPro and I used to make these like GoPro edits. And I was actually thinking about putting them on my Instagram as like a, uh, quarantine special, but they're some of them. They're terrible. But I, I used to make these Instagram, not Instagram ads, but, uh, edits with a GoPro. And when I moved down here in 2012 from Missoula, I wanted like I made these you know, these um, GoPro videos, and like I sort of felt like they were cool. They were like highlight clips, but I didn't really um, get to tell much of a story, and so. I started to explore like getting a DSLR style camera and I started work. I did a couple of videos with Rush Schnitzer, um, one for trouts uh, way back in the day. And then we did, a, we did two, um, you know, two videos and I was like, he would basically set the camera to the settings he wanted it. And I would just sort of frame the shot. I was not very good at it. And what it was, that was sort of when I started to, get more interested in the technical side. And I started, you know, I did videos, you know, with a bunch of my friends and um, started, you know, you know, Tanner and I became good friends. We were hanging out and I was taking video and stuff like that. Um, putting that on Vimeo, it was getting some, you know, pretty decent views. Um, and that all just sort of, I mean, this has been since 2008 that I've been interested in photography. I think probably since 2012, was when I started to take it a little bit more seriously and probably the last four years where I've really, really taken it seriously. Um, and I got my foot in the door with Trouts uh, through video stuff. And, um, you know, my friend Max, who actually is there in the comments, he came out and he wanted to do photos uh, for Trouts. And that's... Like I was, wasn't taking photography as serious. I was looking at video as sort of the thing I liked to do the most. And his visit actually sort of sparked this fire in me to get a little bit more serious with my photography. So um, I don't know if I answered that question at all. It's just sort of like, it's been a long circuitous route to where I am currently. Um, I don't know, I mean, it's all sort of self-taught. And um, I think for, from my perspective, getting into fly fishing photography, fly fishing content creation, I think it's like, it's about connections, like anything else in this world is about connections, but then it's also just about putting out quality stuff uh, consistently um, and being willing to uh, hear no a couple times. And I got, you know, you know, lucky that the job opened it up when it did at Trouts and um, have been able to take you know, make, uh, make the most of my time there, you know, getting out and, and getting more shots in the field and stuff like that. So I don't know if that answers the question. Hopefully it does. Maybe. Uh, DJ Arcade asks, do I use presets in Lightroom? So I used to use presets in Lightroom. Um, I've shied away from that now. And, you know, I might basically, if I go out and shoot, I'll take, a couple, like I'll choose, when I go to edit, I'll choose, let's say I have a thousand photos from a shoot. I'll choose three that I think are sort of like the ones that represent the photos that day the best. And then I'll go through and edit those. And I'll edit 
you know, do exposure, co contrast, bright, you know, not brightness, uh, highlights, shadows, blacks, whites, um, you know, move into, you know, hues and saturation, and luminance, and all that stuff. And I'll fine tune every photo, or not every photo, but those three photos, sort of where I think I want the photo set to look like. And then I'll take those and use that as a preset that I'll apply to the rest of the photos. Um, I think presets were a cool way to achieve a look, but it's um, once I think you become more adept at editing in Lightroom, you don't necessarily need to use those unless you're creating presets for yourself. Like I know Matt Dirksen, this is something I learned from him, is he, he's a photographer over at, uh, with the Rockies and he uses presets, but he has like very specific lighting conditions um, that he sees throughout the season. And so he has presets for night games. He has presets for, you know, afternoon games. He has presets for different color jerseys. Um, and so he's created presets for himself. I think that's where the, you know, that's sort of important. I think the, it's less so with um, you know, using someone else's presets because they are shooting under different conditions. They're maybe sh their style of shooting is different and, um, you know, as you can use it as a good guide, I think you can use it to sort of learn how to learn how a look is achieved. But I think in the end, doing it yourself is going to give you the most control. So, um, David Stilly asks, so walk through how you took pictures of your own fish. All right. I don't have my net here. Damn it. All right. Okay. Let me back up. So caught the fish, have my camera, have my net. I would, you know, roll that net, <clears throat> put it in the water, grab my camera, get the settings right. And then basically, here, how, how can I here my, see my sweatsuit? So I'll cradle the fish like this. Yeah, like this. And then I'll shoot. Like I'll do a, I'll sort of spray like this. And I might spray like that. Um, if the fish is laying down and it's it's not it's staying still, like you can do that and then sort of position yourself here. Um, you know, let's say I use my phone. So like, I'll just sort of spray like that, and then spray like this. It's trial and error. I take a lot of terrible photos, as I mentioned, but. Um, yeah, you just sort of <clears throat> use the net to your advantage and use burst mode to your advantage. I think those are the two things that uh, are most important from my perspective. Can you touch on white balance? I know early on I was so, so focused on shutter speed, aperture, ISO. I was confused why my photos kept on coming out cold blue or super warm until the orange. That's from Max. Um, so one of the benefits, I think, for, to shooting raw is that uh, white balance is something you can adjust really well in post. Um, I think that is one of the things that when people go through and edit, they don't necessarily pay as much attention to. And it also, if your white balance is off, your colors look a little bit weird. Um, so correcting that early on in the edit process is something that I definitely pay attention to. For the most part, I shoot auto uh, white balance, um, especially if I'm shooting uh, in a pretty relaxed setting. Uh, if I'm out there shooting for trouts, like we're going out um, to you know, go to Deckers or go to Cheeseman or something like that, and I'm shoot. That's all I'm doing is, is shooting. Um, I will adjust my uh, white balance throughout the day, you know, depending on you know where the sun's coming from, how the sun's hitting. Uh, I do think that white balance is super important, especially when it comes to making sure the colors in your photo are the most accurate they can be, uh, or look the the best they can. Um, so. I still rely a little bit, probably too heavily on auto white balance, um, but <clears throat> definitely in post is something that I uh, correct quite a bit. So uh, any more questions for, for me guys? Appreciate you guys all tuning in. Um, hopefully this is a sort of clear. If you guys have any more questions, uh, feel free to shoot me an email, uh, Yvonne at troutsflyfishing.com. Um, I'll put that here in the comments. Um, I try to get back to, you know, those emails as much as possible. Uh, 
you know, I think, um, you know, going out and shooting is probably the best, best thing you can do. Uh, shooting, shooting again, shooting more. Uh, that's going to be the way, that's the way I've, I've improved over time. Uh, and, um, that, and then comparing my, my stuff to things that I want to, you know, looks I want to achieve. So, uh, certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, we're going to have on Thursday, Courtney, uh, our education director is going to be talking about, uh, fishing streamers. So make sure to tune into that. And then we also have some more live streams coming up in the, uh, coming days. Uh, hopefully you have some more stuff scheduled. I think we're going to do five flies live as well. Um, so appreciate you guys all tuning in. Stay safe out there. Bye. Oh God. Where do I go? Not quite yet, but because you all this back and say, God, wait. Huh? All right. See you guys.